constantly, which is what I should be doing all the time. Uh, sleep should be my enemy, a full meal should be rare, and uh, every paycheck a, a fortune, every day a, a, a holiday, and every meal a feast, or something like that. Basically, <laughs> happy to still be best related with all of you. And so this year, I also did five documentaries, and the Independent Film Channel, they're a wonderful company. Um, They gave me a truck of money. They said, here's a bunch of money. Make three documentaries. I was like, oh, damn. That's a lot of leash to run around the yard with. Okay. And so I went to South Africa with a film crew recently. And uh, I, I interviewed a lot of people in Johannesburg and Cape Town. And I met some of the most amazing humanitarian aid workers I've, I've, ever, I've ever met. And I met quite a few of these people all over the world. And in South Africa, as you know, there's a big HIV and AIDS problem. There's a hunger problem. And at one point, I'm interviewing a guy named Dr. Ashraf Greenwood. He's part of a, he, he runs an HIV AIDS clinic in the Cape Town area. One doctor, three nurses, 200 patients a day. He is, he's amazing. 17 hour days. At one point, I, I asked him, how the hell do you do this? Expecting some lofty answer. Well, Henry, all you have to do is really want to help. And then all of a sudden, everything will coalesce in one long chain of beneficent feeling. And look, I get up really early in the morning, look at my face! This looks like I've been running for the last 80 years. And so I'm standing outside of this amazing facility as I watch the young HIV mothers, HIV positive mothers, and their daughters walk by. And I said, so they're all HIV positive? He said, yeah. And then they come here for antiretroviral drug treatment? He said, yeah. I said, do you do anything as a preventative measure? And he said, Henry, I have given the condom speech in all of these townships until I'm blue in the face, and it does no good. He said, here's what happens. These people don't have enough food. They, they're hungry. They have food insecurity. They suffer famine. They, you know, they, they, when you don't eat, you go crazy. You do wildly, desperately stupid things. These young girls, they don't get enough to eat, so they sell their bodies to men who refuse to use protection. What happens, they become infected and or pregnant, quite often both at the same time. So they have the kid. Now, Henry, what do you think they do? Uh, stay inside and let the kids starve, or go out and do the only thing they know how to do, and further infect themselves and, and ruin their lives. I go, they, they do the, 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 the latter. Yes, Henry. And, and so basically, he said, if you want to solve all of this, if you want to see HIV and AIDS become a thing of the past in South Africa, you cure the food, well, the problem of food insecurity, and this becomes a memory. Or at least it becomes minimized to a great degree very quickly, because all it is is desperation. So he said, what are you going to do about that? I'm like, I don't know, stuff. And the idea of solving world famine, it's a huge idea. And there's no simple answer. You, you, it's not a matter of depriving Van Halen fans of their food. Uh, it's an interesting irony that America suffers a problem with obesity. I mean, obesity leads to a lot of deaths in America. It kills more people than Al-Qaeda ever hoped to. There's a certain authority in us who have other respiratory problems that people get because they eat too much. So eating too much is almost as dangerous as not getting enough food, which is kind of interesting. And so here in America, our food problem is that we eat too much. In parts of the world, like in parts of Africa, in parts of the Middle East, in parts of Central Asia and Eastern Europe, they're not getting enough food. Uh, and there's some awful statistics. Uh, in, in South Korea, they waste so much food that they can take the food in garbage trucks and drive it 40 miles across the frontier to Pyongyang, to North Korea, dump it on the street, and feed North Korea on South Korean garbage. Of course, uh, that won't happen, but people would gratefully dive into a truck and eat vomit if, if it would feed them. People get that hungry. And so I got kind of interested in, in famine after seeing so many homeless people all over the world, and they stick their hand out, and they go, can you help? And you realize you want to, but you can't really. And then if you give them some money, you feed them for like 20 minutes, and then they're hungry again, and the problem still remains. And if the problem is as easily solved as just taking your unwanted slice of pizza, putting it into an envelope and addressing hungry person in Africa and dropping it into the mailbox, famine would be a thing of the past because we would all do that right now because no one wants to see anyone else in the world hungry. You get to eat, why shouldn't everyone else? It makes sense. But obviously it's, it's a huge problem that is a huge global concern. And so I became really interested in being part of the thing that knocks world famine on its ass. And all you can do is one person is a little teeny tiny thing, but it's better than doing no thing at all. And so at one point, I ran into a guy, a buddy of mine, a producer, and he gave me this, this uh, DVD. 
and it was called Anxious for Hunger. It's a documentary on famine. He said, watch this tonight, get back to me. I said, okay. So I watched it, and it's basically a French man. He speaks French. He's from Paris. He's an actor, and he's yelling down the barrel of the lens for 90 minutes, talking about world famine. He's a few chalkboards behind him. They're clear glass. He's drawn on the chalkboards, pie charts and statistics all over this. He's frantically yelling information at the camera. Meanwhile, uh, a movie plays behind the screen of, of people in appalling states of, of hunger, and it was devastating. You know, even though it's in subtitles. And so I watch it, and I talk to the. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Does anyone remember laughter? <laughs> so I watched this thing, and, I, and the guy gets back and he said, what do you think? I said, I think that, that documentary ruined my life. And he said, the director wants to shoot it all over again, but in English. And he asked me to find a really angry guy who speaks English. And I said, have I got the guy for you? So that's how I got involved in this documentary called Aceous for Hunger. And so we gave the script to the World Food Program, who works you know, by the UN, and we said, go through these facts and figures and make sure they're watertight. And they corrected all of our errors, and they gave us film footage to use, and I uh, became the co-financier of this documentary. And my logic was, uh, I should put my money where my mouth is, because it, it's, it's nice to say, I care. But we know you give a fuck when you sign a check that makes you go, Spleen! <laughs> I did that because I believe in the project. And so that was another one of the documentaries I shot this year. And we shot that in Chiang Mai, Thailand, in a small production space. And it's not a bad place to live for a few weeks, Chiang Mai, Thailand. I've been to Thailand many times in my life, not for the normal reason of a single white male goes to Thailand. <laughs> No, I've never been with a 15-year-old prostitute or any prostitute at all, anywhere. But when you're a solo white male walking the streets of Bangkok, everyone thinks you're there for, you know. And young girls go up and put their arm up in the ears and go, hey, let's go on a date. And I have to give them this speech, the self-esteem thing. You are selling your vagina to strangers. Don't you know how dangerous that is? You should be home reading a book. <laughs> what are you, a fucking narc? <laughs> no! And so, we shot this documentary, and after that was finished, the director said, Hey, what are you doing the next couple of weeks? I said, mm, Not a whole hell of a lot. He said, You want to go to Burma? It's right up the road. I went, Oh, shit, let's go to Burma. So we got visas and we went into Burma. Five middle aged men with expensive cameras trying to pass themselves off like tourists. We're not making a documentary. He doesn't have a microphone clipped through his collar. He's not standing in front of places he shouldn't be standing in front of saying, this is a place I shouldn't be standing right now. Mom, we're just making home movies. And so me and this film team, we drove 1,200 miles uh, all, all up and down and across Burma. Burma has no roads. So all day long, the van's like <laughs> You have to hold your camera gear in your lap. If you put it on the ground, like all your lenses will break. It was a long two weeks. We were surveilled by the cops. We, uh, we had people giving us very, very stern looks because we're basically trying to shine a light on what is happening in Burma, which is not a lot of good. Very nice people there. Burma is a very confusing country. I'm not going to try to issue you some tutorial on the place. But there's, there's hardly any people that are exactly Burmese. There's the Wa, the Kalung, the, the, the Chin, the Kachin, the Karen. There's all these different people, different languages, and oftentimes they fight each other. There's like seven little civil wars happening at once. And Tan Shui, the senior general of the junta, is the overlord of all, a man with an eighth grade education who's mentally infirm, who goes to his astrologist to make big decisions. And, and, and meanwhile, the country has sanctions exacted against it, which only punish the poor. And so we're driving through these villages, and you meet people whose whole life is spent bent over in a rice paddock, basically, you know, getting rice and trying to bring, get some sustenance from the earth. And some of these people you meet are some of the kindest, most gentle, and most generous people. And I've always wondered why, when you go to a poor place, people who've known nothing but famine and thirst and uh, tribal genocide and ruthless totalitarian, totalitarian dictatorships, why are they always the friendliest? And often people with plenty are always so stingy and loud and pushy. I've never been able to figure that out, but I'm starting to get my head around it. My theory is, some of these people have been through so much hardship, they want to leave it in the past, and they want to get on to the good part of their life, and they're happy to take you along with them. So maybe that's a good idea. <laughs> what you have?